right, the spirit of life eternal. Please stand. I now invite to the podium this morning's speaker, Reverend John, who will prepare you for celebrating this wonderful month of May. Reverend John. Good morning again, friends. And a special welcome to you all and to those who join us on the internet. It is Child Month. You remember the games you used to play as children? Who played Babsa Kaiser Cup, Pinga Shell? Two people. Wow. None of this modern generation plays those things. They're on Xboxes and Game Boys and Game Girls. But it is Child Month, and I've been enjoying um, some of the, of the emails and WhatsApp messages various people have been sending me, which underscore the wit, wisdom, honesty, and humor of young people. Temple member George Young, affectionately known as Junior, sitting at the background there, sent me some yesterday that gave me a good laugh, and so I wanted to share this one with you. Teacher says, Harold, what do you call a person who keeps on talking when people are no longer interested? Harold. A teacher? <laughs> I'm glad he didn't say a minister. <laughs> then there's the one about Little Johnny. You know, you know she said jokes about Naughty Children always, are, always name him Little Johnny. Little Johnny asked Grandma how old she was. And Grandma said, um, uh, 39 and holding. <laughs> Little Johnny thought for a moment and then said, and Grandma? How old would you be if you let go? <laughs> I really wonder how old we would be if we let go. Children do that, don't they? They're vexed and they throw a tantrum, or they're happy and they're screaming and shouting and running around, and then it's finished in a minute. They're, oh, it's over. They, they don't keep things, you know, forever and ever in their, as we say in Jamaica, in their craw. In, um, so when it comes to to trusting and to being able to just live in the moment, children have a, le a lesson to teach us. So I've, I've called my encouragement, as I call the mass and the messages, today's encouragement, and a little child shall lead them. Now, that comes from Isaiah, and Isaiah was not really talking about children leading adults, but that's my interpretation today. Isaiah was envisioning a world that worked for everyone. And so he says, in that world, there will be complete peace and harmony, the goal that is sure to be attained by all. And the lion and the lamb and um, wild animals and, and tame ones will lie down together in perfect peace. And a little child, in its innocence and its trust and its beauty, will lead them. 
But I also believe that we can follow the example of little children in all kinds of ways and learn to be more joyful, more playful, to really enjoy life. And so this morning, a little child shall lead us in many different ways. And speaking of learning from our children, uh, weren't the young adults, the teens, and the kids absolutely awesome at Youth Sunday last week? They were just wonderful. Ah, yes, I want us to give them a hand, but I want us to do the laughter yoga la um, clap, which we do every year in the month of May. I don't know if those of you remember it. You put your hands together so all the fingers are, are, are matching, and you clap three times as you say, very good, very good, very good, and you throw your hands in the air and say, yay! So we're going to do it three times. Very good, very good, very good, yay! Very good, very good, very good, yay! One more time, very good, very good, very good, yay! Excellent. Whenever I do a blessing of babies, I usually quote Khalil Gibran, um, the Lebanese-American artist and poet who wrote in his book, The Prophet, and I quote, your children are not your children. Sorry, parents, that's the truth. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday." Unquote. You may strive to be like them. And what are they like? What are children like? I find that they are authentic. They are honest about their feelings. They celebrate diversity. In fact, they're not at all interested in what color anybody else is or what gender. They just accept life as it comes. And they have a deep and abiding trust that what they want will be theirs, at least until we teach them to doubt and to fear and to discriminate and to um, take on the baggage that we bring, so many of us, from our upbringing. So I think this may be why Jesus, the beautiful, says in Matthew 19, 14, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And remember, he also told us that the kingdom of heaven is right here. So of the innocence of a child, of the beauty of a child, of the trust of a child, of the authenticity of a child, of the, the honesty and purity of a child, that's what we have at hand and what we have to nurture and cherish and value and preserve. Joan Borisenko, in a marvelous little book called Seven Paths to God, points to a penetrating study by Harvard theologian James Fowler on how we develop faith and its relationship to our psychological development. According to this eminent researcher, studies show that we actually invent God in our own image, which we know, you know, the Bible says, and he created us in his image and likeness. Now we turn around and invented him after how we think um, he should be. So um, this psychologist says, in fact, we don't invent God after our image. We invent God after the image of our caregivers, the people who raised us, which is an interesting concept. Because if you had parents that were abusive or neglectful or unreliable or critical, you grew up with a concept of God as a punitive external force that was sitting there, you know that image, up in the clouds writing down your, your name in a golden book or not. You know, there was this idea that God was, was vengeful and, and you had to curry favor, as we say in Jamaica. 
On the other hand, if you had loving and supportive caregivers when in your formative years, you're likely to grow up with high self-esteem and, and imagine a God who, like your caregivers, is beneficent, compassionate, and supportive. So as we mature psychologically, according to this study, over the period of our lifetime, we are able, if we are able to heal the wounds of our sense of self, our idea of God, and with it our faith, undergoes systematic changes. It's as if we grow in faith. According to Fowler, there are six stages of psycho-spiritual growth in relation to faith. And I just wanted to share them with you very quickly. Before the age of seven, little children live, as you know, in an imaginative world populated by angels, fairies, demons, and monsters. I remember as a child always looking under the bed every night and in the closet. I was terrified, you know. Daddy had to, before putting us to bed, look under the bed and look in the closet because I was certain there was a bogeyman in there. In addition, children before the age of seven imitate the people around them and assume their beliefs. I'm certain that's where this deep-seated fear of lizards comes from in the Jamaican people. How can you live in a tropical country which, in which lizards are a given and be terrified of lizards? We learned it from the people who were, who were older than us, and we learned to fear, and it's a lifelong fear. You know, I know big people who will run screaming from a room over a poly lizard. And I have a good friend who I love very much. She traveled with our bagon. Just in case the hotel room have a croaking lizard. And then you know how the law of attraction works. How does the law of attraction work? We went on a retreat one time. And the only room that had a big croaking lizard was in my friend's room. Who should, it would be a very short shrift of it, though. No one but I give her a new sermon about God's creatures. Not in the same, I agree, but not in my room. <laughs> so we learn those fairs and they are deep-seated. So think of the implications of this. If a child lives in a frightening household where there is anger and screaming and, and acrimony, or is exposed to the traditional concepts of a fire and brimstone god, those early images become deeply ingrained in their psyche and create a fear-based faith which keeps them living in fear of the wrath of a vengeful god. Wow. Can you imagine? If, even as a child, I couldn't understand. Why would the god of love also condemn me to burn in, in you know, hellfire because I'd created some minor transgression like cutting out the pudding the, the cornmeal pudding from underneath, scoop it out from underneath. I'm just saying, I always had a sweet tooth. So, so between seven and puberty, children go through a second stage of psychological development in which they tend to see things in black and white. And by the way, I thought this is so funny because if you look around the church this morning, there are so many people in black and white or black top or white. If you ever notice it at church some Sundays, there's a predominant color. This morning it's black and white. I don't know if this is significant, but children between puberty and uh, between the age of seven and puberty take everything literally. There are no shades of gray. There are only, it's, only, it's right or wrong. It's fair or unfair. And they have a sense that you know, justice must prevail and they want revenge always. It's kind of um, the reward and punishment that one gets from Santa Claus. It's a bit like Santa. If you're good, you, you get rewarded. And if you're not, you get, uh, uh, if you're bad, you don't get the goodies. So at puberty then, our young people enter a third developmental stage in which they begin to think for themselves, hopefully. It is at this time that we begin to look beyond the beliefs of our family and to embrace the beliefs of our peers. And God help you if there is a large gap between the two. Our faith at puberty now becomes an extension of our interpersonal relationships and the need to fit in and be acceptable with the peer group. And if you are a mother or father of teenagers, you know that that can be a very rocky time because they object and oppose everything. Um, it's a very rocky stage, but it's a necessary stage of their development. But as life progresses into adulthood, a fourth stage unfolds. 
and we begin to develop the capacity to reflect on ourselves as individuals and to face the inevitable tensions that occur between who we are and what people want us to be. And that's where you sometimes now have the head-on collisions with parents and caregivers because we wish to establish our independence and, and, and to be different. I always smile because in being wanting to be different, we follow the peer group and we're actually all clones of each other you know, at that age. But we don't think so. We think, oh yes, I'm, I'm thinking for myself and you can't tell me what to do. And do, do you remember when you were a, a, a young adult and you thought you knew it all? And then you get to age 40 and you think, we never know nothing. <laughs> you know, if only I had known that I didn't know. But it's a wonderful time because you are testing your wings and, and finding out for yourself what you really believe. When I watch our teenagers here and I listen to, or I read the treatments that they do and the affirmations, I think, wow, you know, they are coming from a place that is, is just so enlightened. Um, and I knew when I was that age, I didn't have that, that consciousness. I wasn't that developed um, as they are. It's really very impressive. They, they write some things that just, if I didn't know for sure that it wasn't Auntie Carmen and Uncle Lauren writing it for them, I would swear that they had help. But they don't. It comes out of them and out of their consciousness of who they are. Our young people have a much easier time figuring out and coming to the acceptance of their divinity. And maybe because this, that stage of development is also um, very egotistical, so it's easy for them to think, I am, I and I, uh, but it's a very healthy thing because they don't have to go through the I'm less than, not enough than issues which many of us bring to this teaching when we first start learning. Am I right? You know, they come with a, with a, a certainty of who they are and where they're going, which is really very, very encouraging for people like myself who have to, to deal with them. But by the fifth stage of their psycho-spiritual development, our psycho-spiritual development, we have become familiar with the paradoxes that life holds. As Fowler puts it, we are simultaneously alone and all one. And the two are spelled almost the same, eh? Alone and all one. We're able to discern powerful truths and at the same time appreciate their relativity. For example, the stories and myths of the Bible, this description of our relationship with God, reach us metaphorically through the language of spirit, and we feel comfortable with the idea that every word need not be taken literally in order for us to pursue a meaningful spiritual practice and pathway. But Fowler says there is still tension in this fifth stage of faith because we live caught between an untransformed world, a world that's not yet working for everyone, and a transforming vision, you know, our idealistic vision of what a, a wonderful world would really be like. Sometimes in our, uh, in our uh, work at the prison, Reverend Michael and I say, ask our, our participants, what would a perfect world look like to you? Have you ever thought about that? What, what would a perfect world be for you? Uh, this is not an assignment, but just jot down for yourself when you have some time in your journal or on a piece of paper. What is your vision of a perfect world? What would that look like to you? Because they come up with some amazing answers to that question. And it always is a world where there is complete emancipation from discord. As we say in our Declaration of Principles, a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature. They don't use those words, but what they're saying is they're envisioning a world of peace and a world where people live in harmony um, with each other. The sixth stage um, that Fowler talks about is called universalizing faith, a faith that is universal. And he considers it relatively rare that people come to this stage of development. It is the kind of faith um, that we find in that wonderful story that I know you, you are familiar with about the Taoist farmer who had this small farm and he had one son. His wife had predeceased him and he also had one horse. And one evening the horse ran off. And the villagers all gathered and said, oh, Vey, you poor unfortunate soul, how will you ever work the land? Your horse has gone. What a way, you're, you're bad luck here. And he said, maybe. 
And then next day, the runaway horse returned leading a, a whole herd of wild mustangs that filled the pasture. And the, the villagers all said, wow, aren't you lucky? You're now the wealthiest man in the, in the whole um, village because you have this wonderful herd of, of horses. Aren't you fortunate? And the Dawes farmer said, maybe. And next morning, the farmer's teenage son got up early at sunrise. He was going to break in one of the wild horses. And as he mounted him, the horse flung him. And he landed and broke his leg. And the villagers all gathered. Oh, baby, what are, what, what are you going to do? You have nobody to help you work the farm. What a way, you're bad lucky. And he said, maybe. And next evening, the emperor's soldiers galloped into town, kicking up a cloud of dust. They had come to conscript all the able-bodied young men to go to war. And of course, the farmer's son, with his broken leg, couldn't be conscripted. And all the villagers gathered and said, wow, aren't you lucky? You're the only one. All our sons have been taken to war and will be killed. And your son, um, you know, was, was passed over for conscription. What a way, aren't you lucky? And the farmer said, maybe. So you see, that story continues over many, many episodes. And in every instance, the Doris farmer, like a, a good religious scientist, said, let me just live in the moment. Let me just live in this moment and live in the knowledge that all things and friends, I want you to believe this. All things work together for our good. And one of the things that Reverend Michael loves to do in the, in the prison program is to make that point. Say, you know, maybe the reason that you are here is part of a plan. Not a plan by somebody up in the clouds. Something that you yourself unconsciously, subconsciously devised because you came here to find your purpose to learn an instrument and become a musician. Some have discovered that they can teach. There are all kinds of potentials that came. And we have been told, if I didn't come here, I wouldn't have learned something as basically as reading and writing for some. So we have a star pupil, which, which um, Reverend Michael talked about on Tuesday evening, called, we call him um, Richard, Dick for short. And Dick, um, he should have been on parole already. And before class started last Tuesday, he said, you know, I've been thinking about why my parole hasn't come through. And this morning I woke up and I just knew what the answer was. So I said, well, what is the answer, my youth? And he said, my parole hasn't come through because I had to be here to do this class. Wow. Maybe. You see me? Maybe. And so it's just wonderful when you can come to the realization, and that's why we're told in everything, in all things, do what? Give thanks, because even when it doesn't feel right at the moment, if you can just trust that inner guidance and go to that place where you are resonating with, with the truth of your, div your divine self and not allow yourself to be sucked into, oh, poor me, woe is me. And just remember, maybe, just maybe, this is for my highest good and praise God. So you know, I was standing in, I was standing in, in a line uh, at the supermarket last week and the person in front of me was getting on bad. And it was the express line and it was taking forever. And I said, Lord, my love, the only thing express about the line, it give you time to, time to express yourself. So, so, so she laughed. I said, you see, this is a new, she said, you're a minister? I said, well, a good friend of mine calls me Irreverent John, but I have changed it to I Reverend. You know, I and I? I Reverend. Can I hear you say that? I Reverend. Uh, of course, and if you're a Jamaican, you don't aspirate your H's, so you may be saying, hi, Reverend, and I say hi back to you too. I and I, because everything is everything. So my friends, that truth really is where I want to leave you. People who reach the stage of universalizing faith have the ability to perceive the larger whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's what we're working on. While at the same time possessing a simple trust in life, 
which children exhibit. You know, children want to bicycle and they don't, they don't question about where the money is coming from or if it can be afforded. They want a bicycle and they expect a bicycle. That's it. They come full circle to being able to let go and trust the universe. That's when you have found this universalizing faith that says, uh, Carol had us say this morning, I am a divine creation. And if you're a divine creation, then, then what Esther and Jerry Hicks call uh, in the Abram, Abram um, literature and Abram work is the vortex. You know, and your vortex is full with the divine potential that is already in the mind of God and which is just waiting for you to claim it, for you to be in vibrational sync with the good you want. So here is the good you want up here, vibrating, and here you are saying, Lord, poor me. Look how long I'm in the supermarket line. If you can bring your vibration up until you are in sync, that which you desire must, must transpire. Let us say, that which I desire must transpire. I like that. That which I desire must transpire. And guess what happened? It means that as the beautiful Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 3, we must become as little children. Journalist Ellen Ratner, writer for worldnetdaily.com, noted, and I quote, I have traveled the world over to know this one truth. There is no force of nature as powerful as the joy of a child. Children have the gift of being able to laugh and play through war, economic despair, natural disaster, disease, and hunger. Their magical power to transform their environment has been recorded for thousands of years. As Isaiah 11 verse 6 prophesied, and a little child shall lead them. Unquote. And so this brings me to your assignment. And this morning in the prayer room, Sandra Cooper said, you know, I just need to have more fun. And I said, that's what I'm talking about today. You need to have some fun. And so your assignment, should you decide to undertake it this week, is to have some fun. And I want you to have childlike fun. So if you have a pack of cards and you can build a house of cards, have fun doing that. You know, when you balance them on each other and see if you can make them not collapse. Those who are grandmothers <laughs> and mothers, um, know the children only have Xboxes and, and this thing. But see if you can dig up an old thing of Chinese checkers. Um, guys, if you can make a kite using the rib of, of coconut palm and tissue paper. Um, a simple one is just to download, to print on your computer a coloring, a page for coloring. You just Google adult coloring and you'll find all kinds of, of coloring pages and just download a page, print a, pra a page and spend 20 minutes, just 20 minutes, coloring like a child. Borrow the crayons or the colored pens and just have some fun coloring. I want you to just play a little this week. Is, is that a, a, a wonderful assignment? Yes. Play. Good. And the second part of your assignment is to sing yourself a lullaby or a nursery rhyme at bedtime. <laughs> now, I usually sing the Brahms lullaby because I'm tender, classically bent. <laughs> but anyone will do. And don't tell me that you've forgotten your nursery rhymes. You must remember one. You remember Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? You remember Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? I want to ask Valerie and Maestro to, to play it through once so we get the melody.
In a blog titled The Importance of Play for Adults, Margarita Tartakovsky, associate editor of World of Psychology, writes, and I quote, our society tends to dismiss play for adults. Play is perceived as unproductive, petty, or even a guilty pleasure. The notion is that once we reach adulthood, it is time to get serious. And between personal and professional responsibilities, there is no time to play. But play, my friends, is just as pivotal for adults as it is for kids. So I want to tell you a little personal story which used to embarrass my brother, Dennis, and myself when we were children. We used to be so embarrassed because our parents, when we were teenagers, because our parents romped all the time. So one time, one of mommy's friends told her that lodge members, men, men, men who belonged to lodges, all had a tattoo in a secret place. Well, Daddy was master of his lodge at the time, and so one morning after he had been at lodge meeting the night before, Daisy, my mother, announced that she was coming into the bathroom as he was showering to look for the tattoo, caught her in the secret place of the Most High. <laughs> there ensued such helpless protestations from my father and hilarious laughter from both of them that Dennis and myself both agreed that it wasn't safe to invite our friends to our house because we had two juveniles for parents who may also be sex maniacs. <laughs> you know, parents, children think you only did it twice if it's two of you, once if it is one of you, three times if it's three. Now. We were convinced. According to Scott G. Eberle, the PhD and editor of the American Journal of Play, we don't lose the need for novelty and pleasure as we grow up. Quote, play brings joy and it is vital for problem solving, creativity, and relationships. Tartakovsky further notes in her blog that in his book, Play, author and psychiatrist Stuart Brown, MD, compares play to oxygen. He writes, and I quote, it's all around us, yet goes mostly unnoticed or unappreciated until it is missing, unquote. This may seem, might seem surprising until you consider everything that constitutes play. Plays art, books, movies, music, comedy, flirting and daydreaming, writes Dr. Brown founder of the National Institute for Play. So I want you to play this week. Go back to that little child within you. Brown has spent decades studying the power of play in everyone, from prisoners to business people, to artists to Nobel Prize winners. He has reviewed over 6,000 play histories, case studies that explore the role of play in each person's childhood and adulthood. And for instance, he found that the lack of play was just as important as other factors, listening to, listen to this, in predicting criminal behavior among murderers in a Texas prison. He also found that playing together helped couples rekindle their relationship and explore other forms of emotional intimacy. Thank you, Daisy and Big John. I loved and wish I had appreciated your romping at the time. Which reminds me of a joke I heard about Mrs. Ronald Reagan. You know, she was asked by a TV, TV interviewer if she had ever con contemplated divorce from her long, you know, long marriage with the former president. She replied, divorce? Never. But murder? Many, many times. <laughs> let us affirm together, I let the little child within me lead me into pathways of love, laughter, and joy. Together, I let the little child within me lead me into pathways of love, laughter, and joy. Turn to your neighbor and say, can the little child within you come out and play with me? Can the little child within you come out and play with me? And then if they say yes, if they say yes, go, very good, very good, very good, yay! Namaste.